I, I'm sure uh, that you've noticed that I have half an hour to talk, and I usually talk about three times as long if I talk on the topics on which I work on. That's not one of them. And I'm sure that you don't want to listen to the minister for half an hour talking about general you know, overview and nonsense that uh, usually <laughs> is presented at such meetings. So uh, let me say a few things that, that uh, well, are maybe more my personal perspective also. One is that, as you know, the European Commission is very much concerned now with open science and open data. And in fact, this evening we have a discussion uh, in Brussels, and tomorrow there is the uh, Competitiveness Council, which is one of the most important in European Union that is going to discuss the issues of open data, uh, not just uh, uh, open publications. So this is one of the topics that we are pressed by European Union uh, to take into account thinking about science in Poland, and I'm quite happy that we have this pressure, that really helps. Uh, then, uh, well, there are many issues r related to uh, open science in general, and it's, it's a big challenge, and especially in regard to opening the data, as we know. Uh, publications are fairly easy, and uh, we have done quite big steps towards open science in terms of publications. First, uh, well, thanks to the efforts of, the, uh, of our Institute of Computational Modeling that Professor Nies Gutka is heading, uh, we have the virtual library in Poland, which allows us to have access to most scientific literature, and uh, it's through the national licenses, so everybody in Poland can use it. And of course, nobody remembers that we pay some 50 million euros per year now to have this access, uh, and libraries are the beneficiaries also, but all the scientists, of course. Uh, we have a system of digital libraries. Uh, we are creating now a central repository of theses. There are lots of universities have repositories of this sort. We are uh, now in the process of really centralizing also and, uh, uh, well, requiring, because of the new regulations, that all the theses that are produced will go through anti-plagiarism uh, systems that will check whether there is, there is uh, no legal problems with them. Uh, we are creating a Polish scholarly bibliography because, as you know, this is a, a middle-sized country, and that's the problem. Small countries teach in English, and uh, every, everything is, is well, English-based, so it's fairly easy, actually, uh, also for social sciences and humanities to publish in the language that uh, is widely read. And as a result, uh, there are all kinds of indices. Uh, uh, it's, it's indexed by the uh, uh, systems like Web of Science or, or Scopus or other. Uh, in case of, of a middle-sized country like Poland with very strange language, which is Polish, that's not the case. We're, we're not uh, present in worldwide databases, and that is bad for perception of Polish science. So we are creating this uh, Polish scholarly bibliography to have a better view on who is doing what in social sciences and humanities in the first place, but uh, also in some other areas. Uh, so, uh, other things uh, related to the library we are in, for example, there are systems like Polona and Academica that will offer the access to the uh, national libraries and the top libraries in Poland, university libraries, uh, from all kinds of libraries all around Poland. Uh, we try to uh, also uh, uh, be careful with the IPs, so there are special terminals and it looks like electronic form of really lending books more, or lending uh, uh, journals, than, um, and then just uh, allowing free access because we don't have the right to do it sometimes. In case where we have the right to do it, uh, lots of things. Uh, in fact, about 2,000 journals have been now digitized and will be uh, accessible through various platforms. We spent quite a bit of money on the search engines that are going to coordinate all these efforts. So there are lots of digital platforms for, uh, for, for journals, and especially at the uh, ICM, the Institute of, of Computational Modeling, we have now uh, the um, CEOM, the Center for Open Science, that is coordinating uh, all, all these efforts and promoting open science in general. So we're investing in our old systems of handling information and uh, searching flat platforms. And in the recent years, we've really invested in several larger projects, also um, uh, some uh, European projects to create language tools. Pol Polish language is, is very, well, hard for, uh, uh, for um, uh, search engines because of the reflections. Uh, 
And that, that requires uh, very special tools. For example, you may have heard about the Watson system that IBM is now promoting and seeing as one of the main things that they are going to uh, uh, use uh, in future in many areas, including medicine. And uh, they're quite interested in making the uh, Polish APIs for this system, but it's not trivial. And so we have some larger scale projects in Poland now uh, that create language tools that uh, could be used. There is a Polish version of WordNet called Słowosiec, uh, uh, which is just like WordNet translated to Polish. Uh, there have been uh, uh, bigger projects in digital humanities, and one of them, the Daria, which is the uh, European project, is just starting. We have a federation of digital libraries, etc. In fact, I have a presentation on infobases that I once gave, but I won't repeat it now. Just, just to tell our guests that there's lots of things going on and, and only a few of these things will be discussed in, in the context of this conference. Uh, for example, in the middle of last year, we already had 24 active scientific repositories. Uh, and uh, most of them are university-based institutional repositories. There is one specializing in history, art, and music called Lectorium PL. There is a, a Center for Open Science repository also. So there are many initiatives how to digitize information and how to open it, uh, including the uh, Polish participation in Europeana, where we are doing quite well as one of the biggest uh, contributors in Europe now. Uh, so, uh, well, even the directors of, of, of institutions like this know that the future is uh, basically forget libraries, we just need access to information. And we, we need this access everywhere we are. Um, the new operational program has just started last year, uh, which will be the uh, seven years framework as usually, uh, and it's called Digital Poland. Uh, uh, well, that, that's about two billion euro that will go into digitization of public uh, data, creation of repositories, uh, including cultural objects of repositories, so not just texts, but as I mentioned, Daria is not just text, it's, it's a repository of all kinds of uh, objects. So, uh, except for, for data, we're thinking about digitizing information about these objects and making it, it, it freely uh, available. Uh, one thing, if I think about the open research data, it's a kind of worms, as, as, as you know, because all this data is sometimes very specific and we, we have problems uh, regulating that at, this high, at a high level. When we think about texts, like publications, that's fairly easy. When you think about data, uh, well, it doesn't make any sense just to release all the data that you measure because uh, you have really to work hard to prepare it so that people can, can use it some, somehow. And uh, I must say that Poland has a few successes in this area. One is that um, there is something called INCF, the International Neuro uh, Informatics Coordination F Facility, which is a uh, uh, which is based on uh, OECD countries that have uh, local um, neuroscience uh, servers, let's say, uh, or neuroinformatics servers collecting data related to brain research and neuroscience. And uh, one of the big successes is the uh, uh, EEG markup language. I mean, I worked myself a bit on EEG data, and I must say it's uh, really everybody is using different ways of uh, describing the data and the structure of the data and if you have a program that usually doesn't doesn't read whatever you get from other people and it's a it's a big headache so standardizing the approach to data is very important and if you if you look at eg.pl you'll find a very nice web page where this uh, markup language for eg data has been defined and it's one of the biggest successes of this uh, ICNF, the International uh, uh, Neuroinformatics Coordination Facility, which, which is based in Karolinska Institute in, in Stockholm. And that has been done by our colleagues at the University of Warsaw here, uh, who are, uh, well, responsible for curriculum in neuroinformatics and are very much uh, involved in doing that, as well as, as some research institutions. So uh, they are able to uh, describe or uh, help to make public data related to uh, electroencephalography, local feed potentials, event related potentials, and other information that uh, you can measure using electrophysiological tools uh, from the brain. And, and actually, uh, I may mention that, that the area where really big progress has been made, again, my personal perspective, <laughs> 
is, uh, is in the biology and neuroscience because there are so many brain atlases now and information about gene expression in different parts of the brain and it really creates a huge progress in this area. Genetics and of course the development of bioinformatics as you know. Uh, so open data is definitely very important and we're quite uh, happy that in the Human Brain Project, which is one of the uh, future emerging technologies flagship projects for one billion euro, as you know, uh, we have one group from the um, um, Warsaw uh, Technical University, which is responsible for databases, which will be the open databases uh, related to neuroimaging, genetics, uh, uh, clinical databases, behavioral data, all kinds of data that they have to collect and make available to the community of people working in Human Brain Project. That will certainly help us to understand lots of processes related to uh, the functions of the brain, uh, the brain diseases, etc. And uh, that's one of the key elements, of course. And uh, this, is, this is something that lots of people work on how to standardize uh, and make this data open. A very exciting project I remember when I was teaching artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, this was one of the uh, well, examples of really far-fetched projects. Uh, uh, that was the creation of uh, what is called the EcoPsych. The EcoPsych.org is a, is a site which was uh, accumulating information about all kinds of genetic and metabolic processes in S. Herisha coli, which is one of the model organisms that, that people love in, in molecular biology very much. And that was followed by the BioPsych, and now there are like 2,000 different organisms that have been described in detail. Uh, all kinds of information that you can find derived by automatic crawlers from papers that people publish, scientific papers. So whenever th there is a kind of a scheme what happens in the organism like that, and whenever there is a missing information, the crawler looks for maybe somebody has published some scientific data that we can grab and create a model behind that. So that's, that's another example. Uh, well, as you know, we have limited memory, and unfortunately, we'll not be able ever to understand what happens in the cell. And that's because the cell is so complex that there's like 100,000 different reactions going on in every second. Uh, the number of proteins that um, people think are in the organism, in human organism, it's about 2,000 families and tens, and maybe, maybe 100,000 different type of proteins, nobody knows how many, but when you look at bacteria, it's like 10 million different proteins. Now, I have some colleagues working on proteins, and they know about four or five. They think it's quite a lot, right? <laughs> okay, so nobody is going to understand the cell. And how can we understand things like that? If we have enough data, if we have enough publications that are open, we can create super systems that are accumulating this data, somehow trying to make coherent models and answer the questions that we have about what will happen with the cell if we eat something which is bad for our health. Uh, what kind of a processes and, and what can we do with this? So let, 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 there is lots of very uh, interesting research uh, which is quite advanced uh, in this area. And the question is, what can we do from the point of view of ministry? Well, we can, of course, provide some money, which is not easy because um, the budgets are always too short. That's one of the things we're going to discuss this evening in Brussels, actually. Um, uh, independent of how much money you have. I mean, if you have more money, then you have more ambitious people, uh, and it's always not enough, right? So we have to think how to promote the um, open science and uh, how to find support for open data, and how to encourage and promote this in various fields of science. And as I mentioned, that's, that's very specific to some areas. So, so there will be very different types of data in different areas uh, where people have to work on the standards. Uh, and I'm sure it's, a, it's, it's a, uh, an area which has a bright future because of so many applications that you'll hear about at this conference, I'm sure. But also, it's, it's, it's very complex. For example, uh, uh, my group has recently got, uh, got um, uh, a patent and a golden medal at some uh, exhibition of uh, a really interesting invention that I think you will use sooner or later, or everybody almost in the world will use sooner or later. And of course, we get lots of letters, why don't you make it open? But we need money to run the group. I mean, the research is still far from being completed. So where do you get the money from? Well, you can count on the granting system, and it's very hard. So the other thing is, well, you can keep your IPs, intellectual property, and you can ask the industry to sponsor, 
sponsor your, your research. So, so in this case, we're really thinking hard. Should we just you know, announce everything and do whatever you want to? And of course, Chinese are going to make fake things or fake devices that it will, will ruin the market very quickly. That's not what we really want. And we will not get the money anymore for, for further research to do it in the way we think it's correct. Or we can keep the IP. So sometimes, so sometimes opening uh, data too quickly uh, or opening all information too quickly may be counterproductive. I, I talked with some people in the industry and they told us, if you don't have any IPs, we won't talk with you. Because then, uh, well, we will not make money and we are commercial. We, we just you know, need to have some uh, uh, intellectual property rights, otherwise we won't make money. So, so there, are, there are situations in which I'm, I, I'm, I'm quite sure that uh, we have to be careful in opening everything that, uh, that we have. But, uh, uh, well, fortunately, there is a wide range of problems where we really benefit because there is state support, uh, there, there is, uh, uh, well, the willingness of, also of, of people in science to create open data. And, uh, well, one, one of the problems we have is that we, we just, you know, looking at, at this problem in general, as I mentioned, we should really look at very specific things. EEG data is something quite different. Uh, neuroimaging data, bioinformatics, genetics, molecular biology, behavioral data, all of this is very different structure, very different standards that you need. So uh, I, I can't see any you know, general solution at the high level. We just have to encourage people and to point out uh, uh, that this is something that's, well, beneficial because public money has to lead to results that are <laughs> benefiting the public. So I wish you uh, great success in your, in your conference and uh, hope that some interesting solutions will be will be discussed and uh, well, and you are going to advise us on uh, where should we as the policy makers in science uh, proceed. Thank you.